Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Deku. My name is Alan and I hope you guys had a wonderful Christmas. I also hope you uh, disabled your anti-dolphin traps, especially the ones around the uh, chimney area for good old Saint Nick. And or for the first time since the movie Solo, put the little known Imperial Army front and center for all Star Wars fans to see. Which is awesome because I've always been a huge fan of the Imperial Army ever since I first read about them in the uh, original Thrawn trilogy. I mean, he was a military force inside of the Galactic Empire that actually was focused on being a military force and wasn't necessarily as swayed as the Imperial Navy was by the uh, Sith Lord Palpatine's crazy machinations. The Imperial Army believed in consequences, it believed in good organizational structure and being prepared for the many ground battles the Empire would wage against its enemies. But since the Empire's territory spanned across an entire galaxy, most of it covered in cold, hard vacuum, the Imperial Army and its ground-based missions were always considered less important and glamorous than the other branch of the Imperial military, the Imperial Navy. Even the stormtroopers who technically were a part of the Imperial Army received more recognition and glory because at least they were usually stationed on board Imperial Navy fleet vessels. And because both organizations were overseen by the Joint Chiefs and fought for essentially the same pool of resources, credits, and manpower, there was a natural rivalry between these two organizations, and there were real ideological differences between the Imperial Navy and the Imperial Army, along with very different operational and uh, strategic goals. It all kind of starts with what kind of people were attracted to which service branch. For the most part, the Imperial Navy was seen as the more glamorous and, dare I say, more important branch of the military. If you did well in the Imperial Academy system and had the ability to choose where you went next, usually you would choose a fleet school or a pilot's academy. While there were stormtrooper academies and other schools designated to create elite infantry officers, being a ground pounder just seemed like a less desirable position, so ultimately the people who lived in the core of the galaxy, that's where the power and economic center was, these individuals usually joined the Imperial Navy. Now, families that were wealthy or politically connected generally tried to secure a cushy officer's commission in the Imperial Navy for their children. Their sons and daughters could gain some prestige and military experience, which would help them on later in life, both in the private and public sector. Well, actually, in a fascist military first state, private sector, public sector, they're kind of all mixed into one thing, more or less. More importantly, these young elite sons and daughters would gain that experience from the safety of a ship's bridge and not necessarily the trenches, which were far more dangerous. Well, the officer corps of the Imperial Army was made up of elite individuals from the core regions of the galaxy. The bulk of the Imperial Army was made up of individuals from the Outer Rim, Frontier Worlds, and even Primitive Worlds. This means worlds that were isolated from the rest of the galaxy and only recently discovered by uh, either Imperial or Republic probes. Yet some worlds on which entire populations were basically descendants of a group of shipwrecked explorers hundreds if not thousands of years ago. These shipwrecked individuals would usually lose access to their advanced technology within a few generations and revert back to Stone Age technology, and then boom, one day the Empire appears like gods from space with their blasters, and suddenly all of these tribal warriors who are using flint spears and clubs are handed an E-11 and a Stormtrooper helmet. That's complete chaos. And so right away you have a sense of class struggle between the Imperial Navy and the Imperial Army. It's the rich versus the poor, the core versus the outer rim, the political elites, and the uh, destitute masses. And while the Imperial Navy had its own cannon fodder in the form of TIE fighter pilots, the Imperial Army was mostly made up of just cannon fodder. I mean, later on in the war, it wasn't uncommon for the Imperial Navy to carry out base Delta Zero, aka destroy the surface of a planet while the Imperial Army troopers were still on the ground. That's what happened to Bill Burr, I mean, uh, Migs Mayfield's character, remember? It should also be mentioned that because so many core world uh, recruits joined the Imperial Navy, this organization was therefore much more ideologically aligned with Palpatine and his empire. This is because the empire legitimately created a lot of stability and economic opportunities, but just for people in the core. Worlds like Vardos, for instance, had massive loyalist populations. And so having core world recruits join the cushy Imperial Navy was not only a reward for these loyal citizens, and also it was a good way to ensure that your recruits were politically very loyal. Now, I'm not saying that the Imperial Navy didn't have merit-based recruits. You even had some really talented individuals from the Outer Rim join up with the Imperial Navy. 
but the elite crust who became flag officers, you know, your admirals were generally connected individuals and not merit-based appointees. This combined with the fact that high-ranking naval officers were usually in charge of procurement of supplies like weapons, ammunition, and even ships meant that there was a lot of corruption going on, aka bribes from defense contractors to these officers. The Imperial Army also had its own corruption issues as well. We see this on Aldani in the garrison there. The local commandant was often given a lot more responsibilities than just patrolling their base. They are tasked with things like local economic development, hearts and minds programs, and of course, handling a wide range of different security threats. The fact that the Imperial Army had to do so many different things on the worlds that they occupied spoke to the fact that the Imperial you know, military didn't really have a strategy when approaching the Outer Rim, they simply did not throw enough resources into these areas to stabilize them, and I don't think they even had enough resources in the first place. The Imperial Army also didn't have the luxury of looking down on local inhabitants from orbit like the Imperial Navy did, and therefore they had to rely on either appeasing and creating relations with the locals, or on the other end of the spectrum, being capable enough of fighting off any hostile locals. And so the Imperial Army was really tested, unlike the Imperial Navy, which really wasn't tested much prior to the start of open hostilities after the Battle of Yavin 4. By then, the Imperial Army had already fought on many different fronts and had been blooded on the terrifying world of Mimbam, where the Imperial Army and Stormtrooper Corps engaged in brutal trench warfare and hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the local Mimbamese. Because the Imperial Army was constantly trying to adapt to new threats and situations and oftentimes going up against near-peer adversaries, well, at least near-peer compared to what the Imperial Navy was doing, which was basically chasing down freighters with mile-long Star Destroyers. This really meant that the Imperial Army had to be competent or get destroyed. As a result, they had to face real challenges almost every day. This meant that the Imperial Army had to be actually competent and realistic in how they approached warfare and adapt to new different situations, which the Imperial Navy definitely did not really do. Which is why the Imperial Army was heavily invested in combined arms warfare and mechanizing much of their infantry units, whereas the Imperial Navy based their fleets around battleships, which from a technological and tactical viewpoint was a huge step backwards from the Republic Navy era, which centered its fleets around assault carriers. We've done so many videos on why the Venator class Star Destroyer is far superior to an Imperial class Star Destroyer, and that has to deal with the force projection abilities of a carrier and how much territory its fighter complements on board and cover. This glaring difference in mentality between the Imperial Army and Navy can really be seen in this Joint Chiefs staff meeting on the Death Star in Episode 4. Until this battle station is fully operational, we are vulnerable. Dangerous to your Starfleet, Commander, not to this battle station. The first person speaking is Major General Cassio Tag. He is the Chief of the Imperial Army. He's the only person in this room full of sycophants and dullards who has a contrarian view about the Death Star. He warns everyone to not drop their guard. He also shows a healthy respect for the Empire's enemies. The arrogant officer he's talking to is Admiral Conan Antonio Motti, Chief of the Imperial Navy. He's a stooge of Moff Wilhuff Tarkin and fully believes in the power of the Death Star. Cassio Tag was a ballsy guy and he would continue to resist the Tarkin doctrine. He believed that concentrating so much power and resources into one battle station was a terrible idea. Gasso Tag was a man of science and math and believed that data analysts and logistics were the key to winning any war. And out of all of the people in that room, he and Darth Vader would be the only ones to survive the devastating defeat the Empire would suffer after the Battle of Yavin. Gasso Tag would be promoted to Supreme Commander of all Imperial forces after the incident. Despite Cassio Tag's ascension into a position of power, the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy would continue to fight for limited resources from Emperor Palpatine. For instance, both the Imperial Navy and Army had their own Starfighter Corps. The Imperial Army pilots were known as Groundhogs, and the Imperial Navy pilots were known as Vacheads. Despite the fact that both of these groups flew the same exact vessel, they really hated each other, and they had a very bitter rivalry. Wherever Imperial Army pilots and Imperial Navy pilots were stationed together, they would have their own separate clubs and bars that they went to. The elite Stormtrooper Legion, who were technically a part of the Imperial Army, were also oftentimes stationed on board Imperial Naval ships, which caused a lot of tension and confusion about how the chain of command flowed on board. The gruff nature of the Stormtrooper Legion also clashed with the more gentle Imperial Navy personnel. 
Inter-service rivalries are very common, even here in the real world. I mean, we've all seen those U.S. Army TikTok recruiters shitting on the uh, Marines' annual expenditure on crayons, and we've seen how all the service branches just make fun of how degenerate the Navy is. But that is more or less good-natured fun. A much more serious inter-service rivalry, like the one that grew between the Imperial Japanese Navy and Imperial Japanese Army, led to some serious issues. The Imperial Japanese Army and Navy also had very different goals. In 1930s, the fuel-starved nation of Japan had basically two options to continue their industrial output and military expansion. One way they could go was north into the oil fields of Siberia via Manchuria, which obviously the Imperial Army was better situated to go after, or the rich oil fields in the Dutch East Indies, which obviously the Imperial Navy was better situated to go after. I mean, these two organizations, just like the Imperial Army and Navy in Star Wars and the Galactic Empire, were very different. I mean, the Imperial Army had very fascist and xenophobic tendencies, and they more or less hated the Western world. Whereas the Imperial Navy had a much closer tie to the global naval community and would oftentimes carry out joint, uh, joint exercises with the United States Navy. As a matter of fact, Japanese leader Admiral Yamamoto had traveled extensively through the United States as a young officer. He ended up studying at Harvard and had fallen in love with America. At the same time, he was the reluctant architect of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. I mean, he better than anyone understood the potential economic and military power of a pissed off United States. And his view on the matter is best captured by this fictional quote he has in the uh, Torah, Torah, Torah film. His story is kind of a sad one because he saw the writing on the wall uh, way before anyone else. And because he fought against the more pro-war factions within the Imperial Army, he actually faced assassination attempts and threats in the uh, years leading up to World War II, or at least World War II, when the United States joined the fight. Yet ultimately, Yamamoto did his duty and fought for his country in a terrible war that he knew Japan could never win. In the same way, Cassio Tag was fighting a losing battle against extremists and radicals and other, you know, kind of stupid people within his own military structure, the Imperial Army would gradually be phased out and replaced by the Stormtrooper Legion, which we all know is an elite shock force, which is a lot more expensive and resource intensive to train. It just kind of made no sense for this development to happen. And Castro Attack only won his position of Supreme Commander of all Imperial forces after most of the Joint Chiefs were killed on the Death Star. And despite being the Supreme Leader, he ultimately found himself having to work alongside Darth Vader, which of course became a huge health hazard to him. Now, that's not to say that having separate uh, military service branches isn't a good idea. I mean, most militaries in the world have separate service branches, and this is so that you can foster kind of different points of views and have some friendly competition at the same time, which is really healthy. But the Imperial military was completely imbalanced in reality, and the Imperial Army was far outmatched by the Imperial Navy, both in budget and also perceived importance. Which is really unfortunate because the Imperial Navy might have all the big guns and fancy ships. But since the dawn of warfare, infantry has always been the key to holding territory and winning wars. The Imperial Navy, in many ways, was just a glorified transport service that occasionally provided fire support. So there you have it, guys. That is the interesting dynamic between the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, Give us a subscribe, hit that uh, notification button down below as well so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. The Bad Batch is coming out very soon and I'm sure we're going to have tons of things to talk about. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. See you next time.